Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 10, and this is Session 52. <clears throat> so, just to get our thinking back on track after the break, prayer, just like every other good work, when we produce it, it's just a self-righteous thing. God doesn't accept that. Uh, there, there is no righteousness that we produce, and your, your flesh cannot be righteous. So, uh, just to say it that way. Um, men walk after their flesh all the time. Um, it makes the flesh feel good, makes it think it's spiritual, which I bring up again because I want to say this, which is why I am not a big fan of devotional studies of the Bible. Doctrinal is one thing, but devotional so often misapplies the scriptures and it gives an opportunity for men to walk after the flesh. And for, excuse me, for that reason, not, I, I don't like devotional studies. They tend to lay doctrine aside, make wrong applications, makes the flesh feel really good, and then they just continue in it. Um, so before we continue to get going here on the prayer workshop, I, I want to make sure that we're all convinced that godly prayer has at least been generated in us. And um, so how do we know if that happens? And now I can take you to that PowerPoint that we looked at a while ago. How do we know if God's Word has generated godly prayer in us? So let me walk you through four steps here. Number one, you understand and believe that we do not know what we should pray, that we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Romans 8. Now, how many times have we looked at that verse? If you believe that, then you know the natural way that you would think to pray is not going to be right. Because Paul writes that for everybody that's reading. He didn't just say some of you. That's just a blanket statement for everybody. Number two. You understand that Paul is our teacher and pattern for proper praying and that our prayers are supposed to follow his pattern. Well, now, if we understand and believe that, here's number three. That you understand that godly prayers are about spiritual inner man issues, not the physical, material things of this world. I think everybody in this assembly certainly understands that. And then number four, you understand the time in which you're living. This dispensation of Gentile grace, not Israel's program. And your prayers are in line with what our Apostle says about what God is doing during this dispensation of Gentile grace. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it, do, do we believe that? Of course we do. Where did we learn that? Where did we learn we don't know what to pray for as we ought? Where did we learn Paul is our Apostle? Where did we learn what his prayers looked like? Where did we learn what the dispensation of grace is and how it's different from Israel's program. Where did we learn that prayers today are about inner man issues? Where did we learn any of that? In the Word. And if we have responded to that Word, if we have positively and properly responded to that Word, then that Word has done its effectual work in us to generate godly prayer. I'm saying that to encourage us that this is generated in us. It's just that now we need to take what's generated in us and move on with it. Yes? That's right. And thank you. We specifically learned it in Paul's epistles. Exactly. Now, Linda mentioned something to me at the break, and I want to bring it up now because I think it's important. Because a lot of people, when they learn what not to pray for, and they understand it. What usually happens as a result of that? Yeah, boy, your prayer life drops way off to just almost nothing because it's almost like I don't, I don't even know. I, I know what I'm not supposed to say, but I'm not really sure of the things I am supposed to say. And because your old way of praying was in the flesh, do you know what happens when you stop doing that? Yeah, you feel guilty. Oh my gosh, I'm a wretch. 
God must be so angry with me. But the truth is, that is part of the process of obeying what proper prayer is supposed to be and what it is not supposed to be. So, I just want to say, if that's happening, don't be alarmed by that. That's actually what, it, getting rid of the old erroneous way of praying is part of this process. So when that drops off, of course, it's going, it's going to be that way. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's see. Okay, so now let's consider that question. Why do we pray? This, this and by the way, I, I, I should say this. You do understand that the more you learn about prayer and the more you practice it the right way, the more familiar it feels, the more skilled at it you become, the more natural it is to engage in. All of that, have, it's just like everything else. The more you do it, the, the, the easier all of that gets. And so now let's consider that question, why do we pray? And by the way, this is a question that someone would ask when they discover, oh wait, you mean God's not giving me a job and God's not changing the weather and He's not watching over me when I travel and He's not healing me when I'm sick and He's not... Well, if He's not doing any of that, why in the world am I praying? I mean, that I just... What, what are we doing here? Okay. Well, when you go to the old way of praying, and look, I even hear grace preachers. I have heard grace preachers say when they're talking about why we pray, their first answer is almost always, just like everybody else I ever heard, because we're commanded to pray. But I'm going to take issue with that just a little bit. Because I know what they're... Uh, yeah. Let me just explain it. Um... When Paul talks to the Romans about prayer, I'm going to give you the verses in just a moment. I'm going to say, actually, did I not give you, I guess there's a verse there that I didn't give you, and I was supposed to, in your notes, right there. Um, I'll have to look that up. Oh, come on, Mike. I can't believe that I didn't, no, it's before that. Paul, Paul talks about beseeching them to pray for him. He said, I beseech you, pray for me. And, he, and I'll, I'll, give you the, I'll find the verse, I'll give it to you next week. I meant to put it in here and I didn't. Let's talk about that word beseech. Take a look here. To beseech is, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, to ask urgently of someone... And if you look at crab synonyms, it says it means to seek strongly. So when Paul says he beseeched them to pray for him, what was he doing? He, he, he was asking them in very urgent terms, I really need you to pray for me. And when someone says beseech, I don't see that as a command. I think that's a little different. They may really need it, but to beseech is, I, I, I just see it differently as, as to command. There's something else here. The synonyms that are similar to beseech, here they are. It's like unto beg. It's almost like I'm begging you to pray for me. It's kind of like that. But that's not a command. To solicit, to entreat, to supplicate, to implore, crave. But, of course, there's a shade of meaning between all those words. But the point is, command is not one of those synonyms. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to point that out. This loses its impact when I don't read you the verse where he says that, that I beseech you. But now I want to go to some other verses because these are the verses that are used to say that prayer is a command. So, and by the way, by, by saying I don't think it's a command doesn't mean I don't think we ought to do it. Of course I think we ought to do it. But, let's take a look. Romans chapter 12. Um, okay. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. 
And then take a look at uh, uh, Colossians 4, verse 2. Continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. I've heard preachers read this verse and go, Continue in prayer, that's a command. Well, look, what I really see when you read the context is you see something a little bit different. Let's read the context first of Romans 12 and, and, and see what that's about. Romans 12, 9. Let love be, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another, brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Given to hospitality. Bless them which perse persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. I don't really see that as a whole list of commands. You know what I see that as? A list of exhortations. He is exhorting them to do this, but really it's more than that. You know what? You, you realize where you are here in Romans chapter 12. You're in the education. You know what those are? That's instructions in godly wisdom. So I don't really look at that as though this is, a, this is a command. I mean, it's like, you know, continue in prayer. Well, then, you know what? Then bless them with persecute. I mean, you know what? I mean, you can just apply it to any of them. If you want to call it, your, folks that are listening on the audio, on the record, if you want to call it a command, knock yourself out. I see it as instructional exhortations that are showing us what it's going to take to get godly wisdom installed in us. So I'm not looking at it from the aspect of it's a command. You can disagree with me. That's fine. I'm just telling you how I see it. Now the context in Colossians 4. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying for also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. You know, when I look at this thing in Colossians 4, by the way, I don't, I don't see that as a list of commands there either. By the way, just look at the one that we've highlighted. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us. Is that all a command? See, if the first one's a command, so are the others. So I'm just saying, what I see Paul doing is exhorting the Colossians about their godly thinking and their godly living. Can anybody see godly thinking anywhere in that passage? Is there anything he says there that's supposed to change the way they think? Look at verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just as evil, that which is just and equal, sorry, not evil, just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master which is in heaven. Well, wait a minute. Isn't that something they're supposed to be thinking then? See, there's an adjustment to their thinking. You know what these other things are? Adjustments to their conduct and behavior that's supposed to come out of godly thinking. So I, I, I'm seeing that uh, a, a little differently. Uh, I didn't show you the verse. Paul has already, you know, beseeched them to pray for you. If you say it's a, com a command to continue in prayer, then it's also a command to pray for Paul. I'd say it's kind of late for us to do that. Because he's gone. But, Serena? It's Romans 15.30. Thank you. Romans 15.30. Let me look over there and see if that's the one. I, I, that sounds right, but let me just look and see if it is. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Thank you, Sarita. That is wonderful. I need to jot that down.
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thanks, Rita. That is really good. Okay, so, I'm, and again, if you want to call it a command, you can. I just don't really see that as being, a, you know, it, 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 uh, tucked in there into a, a, a list of commands. This looks like instruction and godliness to me. And, um, okay, and so here's another one in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, pray without ceasing. Look, if you just look at it all on its own, it just looks like he's just telling them. Pray without ceasing. It's a command. But let's look at the context of this. I'm not going to keep doing this. This is the last one. But look. And we beseech you, brethren, <laughs> to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. What is he doing there? Look, if you go back to the front of this list, he says, and now we exhort you, brethren... An exhortation is not a command. I looked through there. Does Paul ever use the word command? He does. Does he ever use it with regard to prayer? He does not. Now, why am I making a big deal out of that? I am making a big deal out of that because, and by the way, let me just give you the deal on exhortation before I, I do that. An exhortation is meant to impel someone to action. An exhortation is something that's supposed to move someone to do something. But it's not a command. You know what? You might exhort someone and say this. Let's suppose Davy says to his mom, Can I borrow the van? And she goes, Yeah. Put gas in it in Grand Falls. That's an exhortation. Do you know why? Because maybe it's on empty and he's not going to make it anywhere else. And you'll run. Why, why put gas in it in Grand Falls? Because you'll run out of gas if you don't. That's what, when you live in Imperial, you learn, right? Have gas in your car when you come home. So the point is to say, the exhortation is to impel someone to action. And I, I, again, I don't want to argue about it, but if someone wants to talk about, you know, hey, you know, it's a command, I just don't, I just don't see it that way. And I'm going to tell you why, but there's more to this. One with authority exhorts, this is in Crab's synonym, this is very, very interesting. One with authority exhorts and equal persuades. I thought that was interesting. So Paul, when he is exhorting us, by what authority is he acting? As our apostle. Right? Okay. And I think I have one more here. Exhortations are employed in matters of duty or necessity. Just like the gas illustration. Okay. Uh, when Paul talks to Timothy about prayer, take a look at how he says it. 1 Timothy 2.11 I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Wait a minute. All of that. Take a look at that. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Did he say, I command, therefore? He said, I exhort, therefore. I thought that was interesting that that's how he chose to do that. And... Um, uh, Look, there are all kinds of exhortations that are given in the Word, and we know that. And, um, and so why, why is he exhorting them to pray like that? Because really, godly living isn't going to take place apart from prayer. And he knows that. So that's what the exhortation is. Um, <clears throat> I want to get to the part. I need to look and see where I am here just for a second because I've kind of gotten off. Um, 
I want to talk to you about why this is a, a, an issue for me about saying prayer is a command. Although the Bible never calls it that, and I don't think those other things like in Colossians 4, that, I don't think that's a command. I think that's an exhortation. And you can say, well, you're just semantics now. You're just saying that, but it's really a command. Okay, fine, call it whatever you want. But when someone says, why do we pray? And someone says, because we're commanded to pray. Do you know what that implies? We should just be saying stuff. That's what that implies. We're just... I, I actually heard a preacher say sometimes... You know, but in fact, she actually read the Romans 8 verse. We know not what we should pray for as well. So maybe I should, well, you know what? You're commanded to pray. Just pray anyway. God tells you to pray anyway. That sounds like nonsense to me. Because here's what I know God is doing with us, His sons and daughters, during this dispensation of Gentile grace. He is not giving us a bunch of commands and we don't understand why we're doing it. Because he always explains why. And why does he explain why? This is important. Why does he tell us why? Exactly. Because if he doesn't tell you why, you can't think like him. You can't be thinking about If he just goes, I need you to pray. Why? Don't worry about it. Just, it's because I said so. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a parent that does, either doesn't have a good reason or doesn't want to say it. Why do I need to clean up my room? Because I told you to, that's why. Well, that's great, but that doesn't tell them what you're thinking. Now, maybe you don't want to talk about what you're thinking because I'm going to strangle you if you don't. Okay, maybe you don't want to talk about that. But the part I'm really after here is God is after godliness. He, he is after, I, I want you to think about this the way I'm thinking about it so your conduct can come out of that thinking. That's what this whole thing is about. God's not into, well, I just need you to pray. And if you don't know what to pray for us, y'all, don't worry about it. You just do it because I told you to do it. See, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, that's contrary to what, this, what God is doing in this whole dispensation of grace. And that's the reason, that's the main reason I don't like the idea of saying, well, we pray because we're commanded to. If you understand why we pray, if you really have, I'm pointing at something that's on another slide, I'm evidently, but if you're answering the question, why do we pray, and look, do you remember what they were at first? Because we're commanded to pray. Not good enough. Why do we pray? Because that's how we get stuff from God. But now we realize we don't get that stuff. So you know what we're doing here? We're correcting the motive for praying. We're correcting the reason that we pray. And the only way you can do that is to understand what prayer really is. And then when you pray, it's with the right thing in mind. So this thing about don't worry about it, just pray because you're commanded to pray. I think that's nothing more than a pretext for just continuing to operate in the counterfeit. Now that's, that's how I see it, and, uh, and that's why I don't like to talk about the command to pray, and we just do it because we're, we're told to do it. I think the why is important. Because now we're able to think like our Heavenly Father is thinking. And so I have this long sentence, and I'm just going to read it to you. I know it's in your notes, but I, I said this in, a, in a, a dozen different ways, so here it is. It, it, it is our desire to be godly that motivates us to follow the exhortations. Remember all those exhortations that we looked at? It is our desire to be godly. To do, Look, let me just back up, let me just back up. So, all this thing in Romans 12, let love be without dissimulation, be kindly affectionate one to another, you know, uh, 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 continuing instant in prayer, and bless them which persecute you, and rejoice with them that do rejoice. And then in Colossians, you know, give to your servants that which is just and equal, continue in prayer and watch, and, and, 
and uh, walk in wisdom and redeem the time and let your speech be with grace. And, and then we get over here and pray without ceasing and, and uh, know them which labor over you, you know, and, and warn them that are unruly and comfort the feeble-minded and support the weak and be patient to all men and don't render evil for evil and rejoice evermore and pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks and quench not the spirit and despise not prophecy and prove all things and hold fast that which is good and abstain from an appearance of evil. All those exhortations... What is the motivation for doing those exhortations? If, if you say, well, they're a command and we just do it because we're commanded. No, we're exhorted to do it. He's impelling us to action and for what purpose? I'm going to go back to reading here. Because it is our desire to be godly that motivates us to follow the exhortations. If Davy's borrowing Sarita's car, what is it that motivates him to stop in Grand Falls and get gas? He doesn't want to run out. Okay. And he doesn't want to get beat up by his mom. Okay. Boy, that tells us something, doesn't it? And that went on tape. Okay. Uh, so, just saying. So, I want to continue this <laughs> off camera. No. I want to continue this, what I'm reading to you here, because isn't that true? It's what those exhortations, we keep those because we want to be a godly people. Right? So, here's the next sentence. It is our desire to have the doctrine work in us. Yes? It is our desire to be conformed to the image of God's Son. It's our desire to have the life of Jesus Christ be made manifest in our mortal bodies. It's our desire to be edified unto godliness. It's our desire to make an impact on men and angels. It's, it's our, a reflection of our gratefulness for what God has done for us when we were lost sinners. It's our desire to glorify our Heavenly Father. It's our desire to be an extension of His righteousness in the world. It's our desire to be roused to fullness of function. I would say, as his sons and daughters. It's our longing to labor with him in his business. It's our need to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. It's our desire to put on the new man. It's our desire to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's our privilege to manifest that our Father is the only wise God, the rightful possessor of heaven and earth, that all of these things, it is our desire for these things that motivates us to gladly obey Paul's instructions to us no matter what form they take. A command, a beseech, an instruct, an exhort, a correct, a rebuke, or a reprove. Wouldn't you say that's true? Because at the end of the day, Nobody can make you do any of it. What is it that makes us want to do that? It's our desire. I mean, I, did, I gave you a whole list of things. I can make a whole other list and not repeat any of those. It's our desire for that. And I'm going to make this statement. If we don't know what to pray for as we ought, and that's all we know, we don't need to be praying because we're commanded to by saying a bunch of stuff that is in contradiction to God's Word. Why would God command you to do that? If He was going to do that, He would have commended the Pharisees for praying. See, that's just nonsense. That we pray because we're commanded to implies that just doing prayer of any kind is somehow beneficial. And it is not. So, lost Gentiles, they pray to their false gods. Saved Gentiles pray to the right God, but guess what? They say the same kinds of stuff the lost Gentiles said. When lost Gentiles planted crops and they didn't have rain, what did they pray to their false god about? We need rain. I don't want to get Billy on the warpath here, but when the American Indians needed rain, you know what they do? They do those rain dances and 
get everything going and get everything worked up and, and, and ask their gods to make it rain. Look, I'm just saying, then you know what? They get saved and then what do we do? <laughs> Dear God, we just we need it to rain. I mean, you know, the, the pagans... Dear God, give us victory over our enemies. So what do saved pagans do? They pray for the same stuff. No wonder Paul said we know not what we should pray for as we ought. All we did was move from lost to saved, but the way we prayed never changed a bit. So, <clears throat> I don't believe God is glorified by either one of those. Saying the wrong stuff to the wrong gods or saying the wrong stuff to the right God. I don't think one's any better than the other. And so, <clears throat> to just pray because you're commanded, I think, means to pray like the heathen and the hypocrites. Now, that's my take on it. If you disagree with that, that's, that's fine. Um, so, um, I'm going to refer us back to this thing right here before we move on, and that is to say, prayer that is contrary to God's Word is not acceptable to Him. And, and prayer which is not generated, this is important. This is not a repeat. The prayers that we pray, which are not generated by something we know in God's Word, are not godly. We have to come to grips with that. Don't forget that. That is really important to understand. <clears throat> I need to decide how, 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 how far I want to go with that. But I, want, I just want to say to you for today, prayers, the words that we say in prayer, which are not the product of something that has worked in us from God's Word, those are not godly prayers. Can you talk to God about something else? All right, look. This is just, I'm just going to whack the hornet's nest. I don't know how else to do it. But here it is. Have you ever had a time when you said, look, I don't really know how to pray about this, so if you want to do this, okay, or if you want to do that, okay. Look, I'm not saying God is mad at us when we do that kind of thing. What I'm saying is, you didn't get taught in God's Word to pray that way. You know what that is? That's nothing more than the admission of, I just don't really know what to, what to do with this. Now, God's not mad about that. But that is not a godly prayer. That's just you talking. Remember we talked about what is prayer? Well, prayer is talking to God. Well, not really. Because the only kind of prayer Paul is talking about is that that matches God's Word and God's will. Now, it is okay for me to say to him, I don't know what, I don't know what to do about that, but you know what? He kind of already knows that, doesn't he? You know what I'm doing? I'm using prayer as a therapy session for me to kind of feel better about it. Instead, you have a different prayer you can pray when you don't know what to say. Do you remember what it was? We covered it in the previous session. By the way, did I give you that sample prayer in your notes? The one that I read to you that I thought was going to be on the PowerPoint? It said, um, let, me, let me just go back here. and It said, uh, Dear Lord, the Scripture will teach me the things I do not yet know. I'll continue to study it in the order in which it was given, knowing that th that is the order that you mean for me to learn it. When I finally get to the doctrine that I don't yet understand, I'll respond positively and properly to it, so it will do its effectual work of producing the life of your Son in me. Did I give you that in your notes? Then I'm going to put that in the notes next time, because I want you to have that sample in your notes, because... When you don't know what to say, wouldn't it be better to say something like your apostle said? Because that gets your mind focused on how to be thinking about it. So when I don't know what to do about that, now 
You, I, in fact, when I look back that, I'll tell you where to locate that if you have it. Um, you have some uh, bullet points, and the last two says, and what is a proper response to his word? A proper response is when we take what we've learned, understood, and believed, and put it into practice in our everyday lives. Then there's a paragraph, putting it all together. Real sonship prayer must be generated in us by the effectual working of God's word, which is the result of our positive and proper response to a particular form of doctrine in God's word. Then you should have that sample prayer. Do you have that? Did you see that paragraph? It starts with putting it all together. Let me see what's prior to that. <clears throat> Do you see the paragraph that says prayer like every other so-called good work? What page is that on? 114. It should be just prior to that. That sample prayer should be just prior to that. Where, Norma, show me on 114 where that is. Okay, you don't have it. I'll give it to you next time. So the next time, instead of just randomly rambling, how about we get our minds focused on the way our apostle looked at that? Because that's a legitimate prayer. Okay. So, all right, now let me get back over to where we were. Um, okay, so let me, let me come back to this point because it's important. I kind of got off track there. Um, the only prayers that are proper, the only prayers that are godly, the only prayers that are really accomplishing anything are the prayers that come from something that we have learned in the Word. Does everybody understand that? Everybody gets that? Okay, because that's important. Um, which, which is why if we just pray because we're commanded to pray, it, the, the, we, who knows what's coming out of that mouth? It's got to be more than that. So I don't get very excited when I hear someone say, I pray because I'm commanded to. When they say that, I can almost guarantee you, well, not 100%, but pretty much, that they don't know how to pray as they ought. Okay. Now, let's take a look at that second common answer. Why should we pray? And what was the second answer? Because that's how we get stuff from God. And that's why people pray, because they want God to do stuff for them. If they think God is a genie in a bottle, well, they love that because they want to get their wishes uh, fulfilled. Now, we've learned that that is not the way God is operating today. Uh, he is very interested in having the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, but uh, He is not very interested in changing our physical circumstances. So, if God's not going to give me a job, or watch over me when I travel, or heal me when I'm sick, or help me find my car keys, or any of those other things, then why in the world are we praying? And that is a fantastic question, because that takes us to the very heart of the matter. So, we're going to have to learn to change the reasons that we pray, change our motives for praying, at least prayer that is done properly. Most people... Most believers are not interested in the spiritual benefits. God doesn't want to make it rain, but He wants the character of His Son developed in you. Oh, gosh. God doesn't want to give you a job, but He does want the Word to dwell in you richly. Oh, what else you got? It's almost like they're looking at a list of foods, and all they're looking at is the stuff they don't like. So I know how people feel about that. So we're going to... We're going to shift the focus here for our praying to the things that we ought to be looking at. Now, what have we got left here? Oh, I forgot to turn my thing on. How far are we into this? We're at 40 minutes. Oh, man. 
What good does it do for me to have this if I'm not even going to punch the button? It's like counterfeit praying or something. Counterfeit button punching. Okay, I only have five minutes. Let me just see how far I can get to do this. Yeah, let's do this because this will get us to, I'll get us right down to the critical point of this. So remember when I told you, I gave you an outline last week and I said, we're going to enlarge on this. We're going to do the details of it. And I said, real prayer is meant to be, and then I gave you three things. Do you remember that? Well, actually, two things and one of them has three parts. But it was, one of the purposes behind prayer was the enjoyment of an intimate relationship with God. Remember, we talked about that. The second thing about that was intelligent communion with God about, and there was three things. Number one, about what God is doing. Secondly, about what our role is in laboring with Him. And thirdly, praying about the circumstances of which we are part. So I want to really enlarge that and flesh that out so that it means something. So here it is on the PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. I did that already. Uh, I did that one. Here we go. The purpose of praying for ourselves. Now later we're going to talk about praying for others. But right now we're just talking about our own personal prayer life. And the first thing is to develop the father-son relationship. How in the world does that father-son relationship get developed in prayer? How, how, do, how do we get that done? And by the way, shouldn't every son and daughter have that kind of relationship with their heavenly father? Exactly. So the question is, how in the world does prayer create that kind of relationship? And here's the answer. How does prayer develop our relationship with God? The development of that kind of relationship takes place by talking with our Father in prayer about two major issues. Without looking at your notes, can you tell me what one of those is? Well, let me just, it's, that's a little unfair. We've covered it. It's a broad topic. It's a very broad topic. So let me just give it to you. Those things which He has given us in Christ. Now that is, one of the, that is one of the means by which we develop the relationship with our Heavenly Father. Somebody tell me something that He has given to us in Christ. Okay. Justification. And with regard to justification, can anybody kind of break that down and give me some component parts of that that He did? He justified us unto eternal life. But in order to do that, he had to do some, he, he did some other things so that that could be done. No, oh, okay. Well, okay. He, he, well, okay, now you've jumped to sanctification on that first one. He, he forgave us, right? Right? Okay. And let, let me ask you a question. Is that a big deal? Can we stop for a moment and say to our Heavenly Father, just stop and think about what that is. We know it's true, but you know it's one of those things that once you know it, you just kind of move on and you don't think about it anymore. But this is part of the conversation whereby we develop that intimate, personal, unique father-son relationship where we're talking to Him and saying, you know what, just talk about what... When He justified you unto eternal life, I mean, is that, is that a big deal? It is perfectly right for you to talk to Him about what that means to you. Just stop and think about it a minute. And the fact that part of that is the forgiveness of sins. What's another thing that He did as a component part of your justification? Imputed righteousness, right? Whose righteousness did God imputed to you? 
the righteousness of His Son, right? Is that a big deal? See, just stop and think. Look, this works in just regular relationships. Did you, do you ever just stop sometimes and think about somebody that's maybe in your family or a friend or someone at your work or whatever, and you stop and think how much they really mean to you? I mean, you stop and think about how they've been beneficial in your life and all that kind of business. You just stop... You sometimes you just have to stop and think about that. And this, th I know that all of this is going to fit into a prayer of thanksgiving. I understand, because this is already accomplished. You're not asking Him to do any of this. But is giving of thanks a legitimate issue of prayer? Of course it is. But let me ask you this, how about this? Uh, we, you know what, it's been dry and everything's drying up and then suddenly we get a big rainstorm. Oh, let's have a prayer of thanks to God because we finally got some rain. Thank God He gave us rain. Look, that's, that's thanking Him, isn't it? I, I won $1,000 in the lottery. Thank God. Let's just all thank God right now. See, yeah, you're thanking Him, but you know what you're thanking Him for? Some, yeah, that's your flesh. That's, he didn't have anything to do with that. Now you might think that, that that is really glorifying to him. What that is is nothing more than a demonstration of our ignorance. It shows us that that word has not produced the right kind of prayer in us. Even if it's a prayer of thanksgiving. So we have to stop all of that. It, that's superstition. Well, you know what? I, you know, I prayed for this and that to happen, and it happened. But I, let's, I'm just, I just thank God for that. I just prayed and told the Lord. I, you know what? That, that's just your flesh working. It's just your superstition reading that in. So that's ridiculous. Imputed righteousness, that's a big deal. What's that next one? It's peace with God. We're, the atonement, the atonement. Uh, we're at one with him. And that peace that we were enemies before, just stop and have a conversation about that and say, Lord, I, I realize that you, I mean, I'm just, just talking off the top of my head here, but Lord, I know that you provided for all of this through your son. You know, when I think of those kind of stuff, and I think, what wisdom to have known to do all of that. And now we're, and that's just talking about the component parts of justification. You, you want to talk about the next one? How about sanctification? I'm not going to do any more on it because you know how to do this. Because now you're talking about the component parts of sanctification. Those are things that were given you in Christ. But you want to talk about things that were given to us in Christ? I mean, that's just out of our new identity. you got some things... You also got some things when you trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, that aren't on this list. Anybody want to give me one of those? No, oh, thank you. Inheritance. What else? How about this one? Were you given the Spirit? Absolutely. Look, you understand... We could go on with this, we could go on with this. What I'm trying to get us to see is one part of developing that relationship with our Heavenly Father is by talking to Him about those things which He has given us in Christ. Can you tell me what a side benefit to that would be? Other than just thanking Him for that and thinking about what those things are, I mean, can you... Can you think of a side benefit of that? Does it help us at all to be reminded every now and then of all the things that He has given us in Christ? And it, also helps change our thinking. it does. All, every time we do that, it changes our, our thinking. And so, um, I'm going to give you three prayers. And here it is, right here. The first one is, so what will we be saying to our Father about things that we received in Christ. The first one is a prayer of acknowledgement or appreciation. 
And that is expressing our understanding of each, uh, uh, of each benefit. Expressing our understanding of each benefit, no matter which one we're talking about, demonstrates that we understand what we have been given in Christ. It demonstrates that we do know about that. The, the, the next one is the prayer of understanding. The prayer of understanding. And this goes hand in hand with that prayer of appreciation. But that prayer of understanding, and look, here's the part that goes with it. Demonstrating that we know the value of each thing that has been given us in Christ and that we also understand why it has been given to us in Christ. Does anybody know why we needed to be forgiven? I mean, just think about it. Why did we need imputed righteousness? Look, just because all of your sins got forgiven, that didn't make you righteous. You needed more than just forgiveness. Do you, you understand? You needed more than forgiveness. You needed righteousness. But look, there's a relationship issue to this. You were an enemy of God. Even if you were forgiven and you were made righteous, that still didn't change that relationship that you, by nature, were an enemy of God. God said, I'm going to change that too. See, understanding that prayer is talking about this, demonstrating that we know the value of each thing. And I know you could just look at it and go, gosh, Lord, all that's really important, so thanks. That's kind of a short version of really the kind of thinking that needs to go into this. And, and, and talking to him, are you telling him why you have those things because he doesn't know? We would be telling him why to do what? To show that we understand. To show that we understand what he has done. Here's the last one. The prayer of thanksgiving. And that is cultivating that attitude of gratitude for what he has done for us. This is all part of how we, prayer develops that intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. Um, there are only 33 plots in everything. It doesn't matter what book, what movie, what novel, what TV series. It's just the repetition of 33 plots. And they're all in the Bible. I'm just going to pull one of those plots out for a moment. So you can, you can do this in a, in, in a it's been done in a, in a million different ways, but it's the same plot. There, there is someone that, um, you know, someone cares about, but they never say anything and they never really demonstrate it. And then when there's some kind of a problem and someone says, well, don't you care about them? And they say, well, of course I do. And then they say this, then why don't you say it? You ever heard that kind of thing? That's all we're talking about here. We're just talking about saying, Father, I realize what you've done for me. I, I, really, I know what this is. I know what this is. I, I know what this is. And I also know why it's important for me to have that. And when I look at what you've done for me, see you know what you're doing? You're building that intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father. And the first way to do it is out of those things that were given to us in Christ. And, we're and by the way, that last one, cultivating an attitude of gratitude, that's supposed to be a motivator for, many of, for much of what we're doing. In other words... The love of Christ ought to be the thing that motivates us. Do we, do we love Him? Well, of course we do. Why do we love Him? Oh, my goodness. Now, we say, well, we love Him because He first loved us. But He didn't just love us and let that be it. He actually did some things for us. So, with those prayers, remember, you're, you're having a prayer conversation with your Heavenly Father about the things that He did for you when He put you into Christ. 
And, and, and what, is that, what are those prayers meant to do? And I know our time is up, so let me, let me just do this, and we'll be at the place where we need to stop. And that is, our prayer about us being in Christ serves to, first of all, remind us of what God has done for us. It's easy to kind of take that for granted and let it be out of your mind. This kind of praying cultivates that spirit of gratitude, which should be a continual motivator for us. It also reminds us of what we possess in Christ. And that should influence how we think and behave, because now we remember we have that. And the third one is, it reminds us of God's much more love for us. And that's coming out of Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. He loved us while we were sinners, but then the, Paul writes, how much more does he love us? And, and, and that should also motivate us as well, um, because God loves us so much more now that we belong to him. It, it also serves to turn our minds toward the spiritual and away from the material. When you're talking to your Heavenly Father about this stuff, it's turning your, it's getting in your thinking, you know, so just what Linda said a moment ago, turning your thinking toward the spiritual and away from the material. And in that way, it begins to activate the doctrine, reminds us of what we have been taught. It causes us to identify God's will, that revealed will that is in the Word. And it showcases what God is doing today. He's doing inner man things today. So it's getting our mind on all of that. And, uh, and, and, and here's this last part of this, and that is our prayer about us being in Christ served to cause us to see ourselves the way God sees us. And, and of course, that is part of our new identity. It also um, causes us to evaluate the truth of who we've been made to be as compared to what we've been thinking throughout the day. In other words, it's starting to get our thinking lined up with the truth of what we've been told uh, in God's Word. And then, the development of that kind of relationship takes place by talking with our Heavenly Father in prayer about two major issues. Those things which He has given us in Christ, and here's the second one, those things which God produces in us by Christ in us. That's the one I want to talk about when we get back next time. Because now, we're not talking about what He has already done. Now we're going to be talking about what? What He wants to do. That's going to be the set. And that's edification praying. And because that's a different thing, we'll, we'll, we'll stop here and we'll take that up uh, when we come back this next time. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for your word and what it says to us. I know this is a lot to think about, but uh, Lord, as we go over this in our mind and we start thinking about this, we're now going to begin to fill in the blanks about uh, what are the ways that we pray to develop this relationship with you. And we realize that's one of the purposes of sonship prayer. That's one of the things that prayer is meant to do. And so, uh, Lord, to do that, um, here are things that we can all begin to practice right now. And then, Lord, next week we'll, we'll turn the page and look at the next thing and the next purpose behind sonship prayer. And, uh, Lord, we pray for your word to effectually work in us, to teach us about the things we should be praying for, ought to be praying for, so that our prayer lives actually become what you meant for them to be. In Jesus' name, amen.